Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Danny. I'm Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we keep it in the family with Gozenzo-sama Bambanzai. Bambanzai! And before we uh, get into any of the discussion, we need to talk about some of the things that might be problematic for some people. Content warning for time paradoxes. Like, I'm sure you all hate them as much as me. Uh, but more importantly, content warning for incestual themes. Now, there's nothing Now there's nothing actual sexual going to happen, but there's a lot of talk about it. <laughs> Is this the first incest warning? Yes. Also a brief mention of Nazis. Just a little one. So, with the warnings out of the way, what have we been up to in the two weeks since the last episode? <laughs> this episode was delayed unceremoniously uh, due to a succession of illnesses. Well, it certainly gave us time to think about the episode because it's a complicated one. Uh, in the time we've been away, I've watched one more One Piece movie, One Piece movie 4 this time, which was pretty good. Though it does really solidify the trend of One Piece movies simply being recreations of whatever arc was currently, was just finished in the manga, because the villain of that movie is just Crocodile from Alabaster. But it has some great animations, some really fun character moments. It's, it's a very fun movie to watch. I've also played Yakuza 7, which is now my favorite Yakuza because Ichiban is such a fun video game protagonist. Like, he's the complete opposite of Kiryu in every way, and that makes him, incre- that makes him incredibly likable. He's, he's so naive and charming. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that Kiryu is not likable? <laughs> no, Kiryu is incredibly likable, of course, but once you've had six games and one spin-off with the guy, the kind of gruff-faced Yakuza with a heart of gold... It just kind of gets a little tiring uh, after a while. Like, it's not bad. You've just gotten used to it. Whereas Ichiban, who's a, a complete idiot with a heart of gold, is a breath of fresh air. How about you, Ian? Uh, so I've been watching anime. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> what a terrible, terrible thing to do. What, what has the world come to? I know, right. I finally got to finish up Azokin, which I had only seen a bunch of at the start. I was mostly pretty happy with its uh, sort of visual stuff. Plot-wise, eh, it was okay. I could have asked for more, but <laughs> I, I'm not asking for more. I'm okay with what I got. I would like if they made like an additional OVA just as like the graduation project for the girls leaving high school. Mm. But like, I'm not in charge of what anime gets me. <laughs> Azokin is still, I think, my favorite show of the year. Likewise. Definitely the best show made this year, anime-wise. So you say that, but certain people online would say that The Great Pretender, the other show I watched, is the best anime of the year. I disagree with this. <laughs> yes. Like, I again, The Great Pretender was, like, really playing into my wheelhouse visually. It had, like, a nice pop art aesthetic. The opening is very Archer-esque. And, of course, they get Freddie Mercury for the ending. With the stupid cats singing <laughs> Queen. Uh, well, not Queen, it's Freddie Mercury. But, you know, I didn't like the ending for that. Like, actually, I mostly didn't like the second season, quote unquote, which is the child smuggling arc. Yes. The last episode really soured me on it because, well, when you've got a show like this, like, it has the same problem that detective shows are, have, which is that they really want to wrap everything up nicely. Denny and I watched Knives Out recently, and mm-hmm. one of the things I complained was how nicely they wrapped up what would have been a great moral quandary if um, the character in that had actually committed the crime she was accused of. And I felt like the same way in this. It's just like they were trying to be too neat and it really ruined my enjoyment of it. Plus, like, I really wasn't interested in uh, Laurent, the victor of the show. (laughs) I mean, that's just kind of the thing with con media in general. If you watch your movies like Open Eleven, for the majority of the people who are there for the con, they want to see it succeed. They want to see it succeed in the planned way because it's like a magic trick, the perfect con in a movie. It, you never understand quite what's going on until the end when somebody explains it to you, but at that point you want it to make sense, but it also needs to happen smoothly. I, I understand, but then this means that like the entire last episode is more or less, and here's how we did it, mm. which is like, I already saw you do it. <laughs> I don't need to see how you did it. I can I can infer how you did it. Also, in cha- in uh, podcast news, we have a YouTube channel now. Link in the description. <laughs> Unless you're watching this on YouTube, in which case, you don't need to be told this. No, no, you should put an anchor link in the YouTube description. I will put a link to our anchor in the YouTube description. So that you can listen to the episode again. 
But yeah, other than that, I've been doing a lot of reading. How about you, Freya? Would you also like to complain about the ending of The Great Pretender? Oh, well, I watched The Great Pretender months ago. I would like to complain that this con art, uh, this con artist show kept intruding into my character drama. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, actually, well, one more complaint. <laughs> So they did the leverage thing where it's like, we're supposed to be okay that they're conning them because they're only conning bad people. But the bad people don't really have anything bad happen to them, as is established oh. in the final episode or so, yes. when they're <laughs> all just buddies with a Laurent now. Yeah. You know, that's also a thing in Ocean's Eleven, where the villain of Ocean's Eleven is just teams up with him in Ocean's Twelve. Uh, in Ocean's 13, and the villain of Ocean's 12 also teams up with him in Ocean's 13. Yeah, it's like, if we want to screw over the art collector, let's screw over the art collector. Let's not just be friends with him at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I am done. I'll give you my thoughts on, on the ending of The Great Pretender when I've finished it. On to the actual topic of the episode, which is Gosenzo Sama Bambanzai rather than The Great Pretender. <laughs> so, so, Denny, uh, start us off. Okay. The anime ran from August 1989 until January 1990 for six episodes, 30 minutes each. Later that year in March, a compilation film named Maroka was made. It contained exactly half the series at about 90 minutes, so Ian will tell us more later what they decided to keep in, what they decided to cut out. The anime was made by Studio Piero, which, although they've been around for quite a while, we've not encountered on this podcast before. They've been around since 1979 and have made plenty of classics such as Urutsei Yatsua, which also shares a director in, with Bambanzai in Mamoru Oshi, popular shonen such as Yu Yu Hakusho, Naruto, and Bleach, but they've also made some weird stuff, such as Midori no Hibi, the your right hand is a little girl and she's your girlfriend anime. That was a weird one. Yeah, they're one of those studios that's like one of the many studios that has span off from Tatsunoko, like Zebek or Production IG. In an interview about this anime, Oshi states that the anime was a total flop, which doesn't, does not surprise me at all, because it's a highly experimental piece, even more so than Cassette, though for entirely different reasons, I would pose. It's a flop. It was a flop commercially. Yes, yes. Influence-wise. Influence-wise, the animation was actually quite groundbreaking, and it seems to have inspired a trend in the anime industry that we'll talk about more later on. For now, it's Ian with the summaries. Very briefly, every episode, except for the last one, is going to start with a, a nature documentary shot that's quite adorable, mm -hmm. but it's not really going to affect the plot, so I'm going to leave those out. So our first episode, um, there's a girl in a goldenrod colored dress and a hat, and she's making her way to a tower block. And inside the tower block, our main character, a teenager called Inumaru, is just, uh, he's just chewing the fat with his dad and... This conversation starts off lighthearted, but it escalates into a conflict with uh, a baseball bat and a golf club. So they're ha having an argument, and then the girl manages to arrive at the house, and she claims to be Inumaru's granddaughter uh, from the future. The future! Obviously, no one believes this, but she shows her unusual birthmark, and this seems to be enough to get them to accept her as actually a time traveler. But the mother doesn't accept her at all and decides to leave the house. Uh, this is about the level of summary you're getting for these episodes. Episode two is going to follow a very similar structure. We're going to introduce a new character called Bunmei Miroto, who is a time cop. The family has now moved to a different house and are just enjoying their daily life, eating nabe. And Imnumaru is spending a lot of time being lecherous and trying to get his granddaughter to wash his back, quote unquote. And he really wants to bang his supposed granddaughter from the future. Hence the incest themes we warned yeah. you about. The time cop arrives at the house. He tries to arrest her for time crimes by visiting her ancestors. And after a brief fight, uh, Bunmei is knocked out and Inumaru escapes with Maroko. Episode three is the Inumaru and Maroko's daily life episode. They're living together now in a third house. They play guitar, they have bats, but their money is running low and they're trying to figure out how to get money. Mariko has uh, seen an advertisement for a hostess club and thinks she should work there, but Inumaru is against it. And then we have a loan shark arrive, who is clearly Bunmei, and he's trying to get Inumaru to pay off some of his father's debt. And unlike the last two episodes, Inumaru doesn't escape this time. We also have a side plot with the mother shacking up with a private investigator. Episode four is like the family reunion on the beach. So there's a, I wouldn't call it a beach episode, but it does take place on a beach. Inumaru is working for the loan shark uh, at a, a hut. He's literally chained to the, to the shack. <laughs> and by sheer coincidence, the mother and father have also arrived at the same beach. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> the mother and the private investigator reveal the results of their investigations that Mariko and Bunmei are swindlers who are conning other families into like letting them in and then breaking them apart. But the family all flees together when the police arrive chasing after uh, Kinikuni, the dad, for his unpaid debt. And Mariko and the detective like go along with the rest of the family. Also the fact that he stole five million yen or something. Yeah. I think he stole the money to supposedly repay his debt, but then they all just run away together. Episode five is kind of the real ending, I guess. In the now the family are living as criminals, they shoplift, they pickpocket, they flee from the police, but uh, it all comes to a head in an abandoned cafe when the police surround the building and Bunmei confronts them. He tries to convince the dad that the only way he can save the family from shame is if he kills everyone else in the family, <laughs> but the dad gets knocked out before he can do so. This is when a stage light falls from the roof and knocks out everyone except for Bunmei and Mariko. That'll make sense in a second. We finally get the truth. Bunmei is Mariko's future son uh, that she has with Inumaru, but he is also somehow her father, and that Bunmei has been trying to resolve the time paradox all along by killing himself. <laughs> episode six is more of an epilogue than a final episode. Inumaru is wandering around, dreaming, thinking back over what happened, and telling his story to Soba stands in exchange for ramen. Well, Soba. <laughs> I guess. So Mariko has left, the father went crazy, the mother was involved in an extortion case, uh, and his journey ends near the original apartment building. And he sees the bullet, in which we establish in the first episode as being somehow related to the time travel machine. So he chases after it, but eventually he collapses in the snow and I assume dies, but tragic ending, <laughs> soft strings, credits roll. So usually we'd go and discuss the anime character by character as we've done these last two times but honestly i'm not quite sure where to start with this there is so much to go on about so i think we might as well start with the fact that we didn't watch an anime we watched a theater we watched a stage play that just happened to be an anime as well yeah i think that it's very apparent while you're watching it but viewing this uh, as something that could be put on as a stage production is probably the easiest way to explain all of the stylistic choices that were made. We get, for example, that the characters rarely talk to one another so much as talk to you in the audience. Episodes mm -hmm. tend to only have one or two major backgrounds uh, and the camera is quite still for the majority of the time. Well, and it's, it's generally a medium distance shot where you have the full stage from left to right, always at the same angle and height, so you get a clear view of the characters. And it, it never ever moves. It does It does uh, track characters sometimes. Certainly. And there's a few other things that sort of give this uh, illusion, like, um, for instance, in the first episode, the mother always comes in from the, from the right. Uh, I was going to say stage left, but I realized that that was more confusing mm -hmm. than saying the right. And you literally get to see a revolving door at one mm -hmm. point. There's also trapdoors, there's the spotlight Ian has mentioned that falls off and knocks people out. Uh, most of all, there's actually an audience that we literally see in episode five, yes. where, when we have one shot where the camera reverses itself 180 degrees, we have a character walking through a door, but instead of going through said door, he literally lifts up the background art and walks past and drops it behind him, and then yeah. we see the audience that way. I don't know if I've really said it, how much I've said it on this podcast. Uh, I've definitely said it in like a bunch of different places, which is the like my general belief is that anime owes a lot to uh, uh, stage theater. This is obviously apparent in the works of people like uh, Ikuhara, but yeah. um, just in general, I think it makes sense to view it uh, from this point of view rather than the movie uh, movies, because when we think of stage actors, they have to project with their body and their voice, in, whereas to a certain extent, film and television acting is acting with the face. Like, again, this is a, a massive oversimplification. So it was actually nice just to see a straight up stage play. <laughs> it was certainly unexpected. I certainly did not think this was going to happen. I, I don't think any of us like really knew anything about this before we watched it. I mean, I guess that's different for you, Fred. You probably knew something about it. but uh, I, knew, I knew that it was like a stage play five years ago, and then I forgot. <laughs> Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about why they would do so, and I think I've come up with an answer. I've actually written a lot about this. I've written over a thousand words, which is definitely the most I've written for any episode. The main thesis that I've come up with is that this is an anime that's about performing roles. 
It's about performing the role of a father, a son, a granddaughter, a time-traveling detective, a Yakuza. But when we watch a movie or TV, we are separated from the characters in that secondary reality that's created by the medium by a screen. There will always be that separation. No matter how good it is, you will never be able to access this same space physically. And shows and movies have gotten a lot better at crafting their fictional reality through props, through staging, through acting, through special effects. It looks real. It can make you believe that's what's happening on the other side of that screen is real. Thus, it is easier for us as an audience to believe that what we're watching is not actors acting out roles, but actual characters. This is not Johnny Depp playing the part of Captain Jack Sparrow, even though it is. But when you're watching the movie, it draws you in through everything it's building that you're watching Captain Jack Sparrow in this adventure. However, with theater, it's different. With theater, you're physically present in the same space as the performers. You're generally in a very small set with a limited amount of props. There's only so much they can do to convince you that you're not watching a, a performance that's put on. Thus, you'll always be conscious that these are people just acting out roles. Thus, for an anime that, ma- that wants to talk about roles, making it the ideal mode of communication. I will say this is the other half of my anime is theater argument, which is, which is the level of abstraction. Uh, you can, you're never going to watch an anime and think you're not watching something that has been drawn because like they're literally pictures in, in front of you. There is a long tradition, well, at least since the um, 20th century of uh, quote unquote avant-garde theater that deliberately draws attention to the fact that it's artificial with the characters addressing the audience, talking about the, <laughs> the plot. <laughs> the most famous person to reference here would be, uh, Bertolt Brecht, and that's literally because he's the only one I know about. He sort of pioneered his epic theater that would uh, have characters addressing the audience, uh, literally, and talking about how the whole thing is constructed. Very much in the vein of an epic poem, I guess, which is why he used that name. Uh, I could be completely wrong there. Sorry, theater scholars. And I think this anime is very much in the uh, Brechtian vein. It's an epic poem? No. (laughs) I would say that when we think of these sorts of quote-unquote fourth wall breaking things, there's a few different ways that we usually do this. The most common way is the lol Uh, (laughs) self-referential, which is like, it's tremendously common, right? Uh, Film, like audiences are very uh, aware of like their film savviness. And so the film people want to be like, ah, see what we did there. We said how, we said, we said in the manga that this isn't a manga. What we have in this show is there's a second mold, which is the classic animation, like the Looney Tunes style, in which the, yeah. you get to just break the rules because 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 you know that it's a cartoon show, so it's just like okay, I can just draw the door on the wall and then go through it because cartoon logic. <laughs> what we have here is neither one of these, but like a third strain, which is that the characters are aware that they're in a story and are actively trying to subvert the story to meet their own goals. This is obviously most apparent with uh, Inumaru because he is the the main, well, central character. He makes way too many references to the fact that he is in a story. (laughs) (laughs) Just We get lines just like, that's what you get for introducing an external character into a story that should have remained entirely within the family. That's from episode five. But what he's done is he's trying to get the goal of getting together with Mariko. And he's like... Like taking advantage of certain plot devices to try and make that happen. Mm, he's trying to shift the anime's tone into that of a heart throbbing romance. Thus, he escapes with Maruka from his father. They shack up in a little apartment and he plays her guitar. Of course, the anime has made it intentionally absurd because it is, well, it's incestuous. Yes, though there is a point in episode six, I think, where he narrates on how where he needed to accept Mariko as his granddaughter in order to begin to move on to the uh, heart-throbbing romance track, even though he was aware that this would also be incest. But he was so desperate to get away from performing the role of the son that he was willing to accept anything, even a, a blatant and obvious lie. Yeah, like this, this whole this whole idea of the family each pushing and pulling the story in their 
preferred narrative tracks is my absolute favorite thing about this anime because I've seen some other narratives that comment on the fact that they're fictional stories, but I've never seen a story where the characters so desperately try to push and pull it in their own way, and every one of them does it. The mother <laughs> wants to kind of regain her control. She wants to reestablish the family she had before. She's pulling it back to what it was. The father, he wants to pull back the respect he think is deserved to the patriarch of a nuclear family. Inumaru, as we said, he wants his romance. The only character where we don't really know what she wants is Mariko. This was this was something that's like I think is really important is that when we were when when I still thought we were going to talk about the characters in general, the thing I noted from from Mariko is just how much of an enigma she is, even after having watched six episodes about mm-hmm. her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's not fleshed out at all. She's purely either like a story device or like a skeleton you can hang your dreams on or something to that effect, right? Very mm-hmm. much the, uh, the point. This is not a criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's a MacGuffin, essentially. <laughs> yeah, so for, for Inumaru, she's a potential love interest. For the father, she is someone who reveres him in the way he wants to be revered. For the mother... Like, she's actually a usurper of the family role, yeah, which is, yeah. I guess, like, an externalization of her feel that the family, the, the, uh, as an externalization of her feeling that, like, the family is moving away from her. Because uh, Gozenzo-sama Bambanzai literally means honor to the ancestor, thus yeah. the, the father is technically Marika's ancestor. Like, somewhat ironically, the mother is the one who ends up being vindicated, right, in this story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not entirely without her own fault. She introduced the PI into the mix, who she's clearly having some sort of affair with. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And engaging in her own sorts of like scams to make her own life more exciting and bringing apart the sort of death of the Japanese family. This is like, would like bring us on to like a secondary theme that's really important, right? The fir- if the first theme is this sort of metatextual examination of roles, yeah. Then the second one is got, has got to be about the how the the family has been falling apart through the 80s and into the present Mm -hmm. yes uh i think it's quite fair to say that the basic trio of inumaru the father and the mother is the japanese nuclear family living in a decent like uh high-rise apartment they don't seem like to have any economic problems is not as far as we can tell Though Inomaro seems to be quite happy, uh, unhappy because in episode one he complains that he didn't have enough money to get what he wanted, only enough to buy a metal baseball bat. What I think is the most fascinating thing is that the family definitely falls apart, like breaks is shattered into pieces by the arrival of Marico. Though it mostly comes about by their own actions. Yes, though the characters assign a lot of blame to Marico for her arrival and thus leading to the destruction. She, as Ian has said, does basically nothing. All she says is, oh, oji sama, and various lines about, oh, how great it is to meet her family and how she should help them. She does nothing otherwise. She's very quiet. I think she has a single monologue in the entirety of the five, six episodes in episode one where she introduces herself. Otherwise, it's always the other characters talking and they tear themselves apart completely by themselves, showing that they always wanted something else, and this this kind of nuclear family idea was really holding them back. The first conversation we see it devolves into a fight, even mm-hmm. before she shows up. Like they were already at each other's throats. Marika only brings it to the forefront. I even think that to a certain extent, the the sort of breaking apart of the family is what Inumaru like desired. He's the sort of typical man. My life is so boring. Wouldn't it be cool if like some Manic Pixie Dream Girl came away and made my life more exciting. Shout out to Manic Pixie Dream Girls yet again. I mean, he needs the family to be destroyed because without the destruction of the family, which means the death of his performance as the son, he can never move on to anything else. Yeah. He he needs to be he wants to be free from the son. He wants to be his own character. He wants to be the central character in his own romance. And yeah, yeah. if he has the family there, he cannot have that. And but the point is that he is fitting into a very typical role uh, as a protagonist. Like I don't know, like Kion and Haruhi Suzumiya. Like man, my life is so boring. <laughs> like wouldn't it be great if well, my life was more exciting? But mm-hmm. Haruhi, it's <laughs> like for him, certainly the falling apart is like is necessary. And that like if he's intro- if he wants a narrative that disrupts his everyday life, then even though by the end he comes to sort of regret his interaction with Mariko, like. Well, be careful what you wish for. This is, to a certain extent, what he wished for. 
I'm not sure he necessarily really regrets his action because the mere idea of Marco is still so much so appealing to him that he's literally willing to die for it. Yeah. Rather than trying to reconnect with his family. But maybe that's more representative of his stubbornness than anything else. Well, I would say it's more like um, the sort of thing you would get with an addiction, right? Is mm. that I, I think by the, the end, like he still wants her, but he also knows that she's bad for him. Well, he wants whatever he's projected onto her anyway. And yeah. speaking of projecting on her, the anime also does a really good job at showing that because Mariko is never a fixed character with a single design. She yeah. constantly changes in each episode, getting a different hairstyle, different clothing, and even her figure shifting a little bit. Just showing how the family's ideas shape what they believe her to be. Yeah, so by like episode three, for instance, when she is living with uh, Inumaru, like she's taken on a more, I would hesitate to say sexualized, but certainly more quote unquote sexy appearance, right? Mm. She is not, she's not wearing the yellow dress and the hat. We're having bath scenes and then her hair is different and her eyes are like not the like white, doe eyed, innocent eyes, but like more of like a seductress eyes. I don't know what I'm saying here. Maybe I'm projecting. Um, <laughs> One of the articles that we read for this, because we read a bunch of stuff, mm. like made a certain uh, argument that that she was representative of Western influence in Japan. Mm. Like, what did you make of that? Being familiar with Mamoru Oshii's other works, I very much agree with the article. It's very difficult for us to transport ourselves to uh, 1989 in Japan, but there was this whole conflict between the uh, the Western influence coming in versus the uh, Japanese tradition going on for uh, forever before that, as much as that might have been constructed by the imperial government, but we'll not talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> no, not today anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, um, and there's uh, these generational conflicts going on uh, too. You can see that in the first episode where they square up, the dad has a golf club and Inumaru has a baseball bat. And there was this whole fad around um, samurai baseball uh, <laughs> where because the baseball bat looked vaguely similar to a samurai sword. Uh, mm -hmm. So it became popular among quote unquote punks. Whereas golf is this stuffy uh, middle-class sport. It's what a manager plays. Yes. And it should be eradicated from this earth. I really fucking hate golf. <laughs> like, as someone from Scotland, I need to defend golf, at least partially. Oh, you don't? In that... <laughs> you should be angrier at it than anyone. <laughs> in that it is a massive waste of space and water, but, like, at the very least, it, in this country, it's not necessarily a purely elite sport. There are municipal links and stuff that, like, random scumbag Neds might play on. <laughs> Shout out to some random scumbag Neds. <laughs> They're playing the wrong spot. <laughs> oh, definitely. Anyway. Uh, I, I also agree with this reading, though I see it as Oshi suggesting that the idea of the Japanese nuclear family was never worth that much to begin with. If yes. it's that easily broken, not by a thorough Western invasion, but by the mere appearance of technically another member of the, West, of the Japanese nuclear family, because the granddaughter fits nicely into that concept. She's there to honor her ancestors, which is, again, a, re a very heavily Japanese concept. But the family tears itself apart so easily that I really see this as Oshi commenting on, on the fact that it's not really something worth saving to begin with. And that it was inevitably going to uh, break apart. Mm -hmm. Did this show predict the Japanese economic collapse? <laughs> no. The only other way we really see the Western influence is by all the uh, Western brands we see. Well, by all of them, I mean the two we see, which is Coca-Cola and Kodak. I mean, they, I don't think this was like anything special about the Western influence. I mean, I mean, the article has something to say about Coca-Cola. But for instance, we see the, the use of uh, Japanese brands like uh, Nikon, well, Nikon uh, which is... Um, Another camera brand. Actually, interestingly enough, this was going to be my one more fact, but I'm going to say this now. The camera that we see in the back, I'm pretty sure that that is a Nikon uh, F801. And the only reason, okay. and the only reason I sort, I think I recognize this is because I was watching a video all about the Nikon F801 <laughs> just the other day, which is actually a really interesting machine. 
But we also have when in episode five when they go shoplifting, they do it in a Japanese brand uh, brand store. Namely, the store uh, Ito Yokado. But whenever they're go- they're uh, a Japanese brand involved, it's them going to something for something they need. Whether it's all right, I need to invest. I need a private investigator to help me um, get rid of this uh, interloper, or uh, we need to steal shit from this store so that we can stay alive. Whereas the Western brands are always intruding on the scene in some way. That's an interesting point. They're always. They're also always like huge. Like the, we have a yes. huge Coca Cola sign. We have a huge Kodak sign on the blimp. We have a ton of um, Coca Cola bottles during the musical numbers. We haven't even gotten to that yet. But for some <laughs> reason, episodes four through six suddenly have musical numbers in them, whereas the first yes. three don't. This is technically this is technically a musical. Yes. So in episode three, there's a whole bunch of Coda, uh, of Coca Cola bottles littering the beach, but. The Japanese brands, as you said, they're always kind of small and uh, hidden in the background through simple logos. Coke is also kind of like associated with uh, Bunmei, our quote unquote antagonist. His design for a start looks like a Coca Cola bottle, at least color wise and also in shape, kind of. And whenever he shows up, there, there seems to be Coke involved somehow. Um, <laughs> it's funny because he very much seems in opposition to uh, this whole, well, the whole premise of the show. He's constantly talking about, um, I need to bring this to an end. Real life doesn't have beginning, middle, and end. That's all constructed. It's all false. He is the only character who is successful in bringing the story to his desired conclusion, eh? except, for, except for Mariko, if we can assume any intent from her. Mm. Also, weirdly, he might be Oshi's self-insert. In his song, he talks about how he has the Bible on his blacklist, and Oshi famously uh, had a crisis of faith, faith and made Angel's Egg because of that. Um, what else was there in the song? Um, guard talked, Dog of Time. Yeah, guard Dog of Time, and Oshi likes associating himself with uh, Basset Hounds. Oh, that, that's actually a point, is that there was no Basset Hound in this show. There is, in the mid cards. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes you're, you're, yes, you're right. I, w- I was like, I was watching this the other day, and I was like, why are there no basset hounds? But yes, there's the basset hound next to the uh, Terry Gilliam Jesus. Yes, and he also calls himself an anarchist, which Oshi has done in real life because he belongs to that weird sect of old anime directors who are left wing kind of. Another thing about Bunmei is that he's also the most adept at performing roles because he performs the most different roles. <laughs> he performs the role of a time traveler, of a yakuza, of a mystery, of a mysterious person, and of father, time paradox, incest, baby from the future, kind of possibly. Yes. I also like that the story never goes out of its way to give us a clear resolution on whether any of it was true or not. So it's kind of the the point that is constantly drawing attention to the fact of how ridiculous it is. Yes, the mother literally says, "Anyone who can accept this ridiculous premise deserves this outcome." <laughs> right before she does the sea Kyle. Yes, uh, and I think Boone may actually himself talks about how we've arrived at this point through a bunch after a bunch of forceful developments having been forced upon these characters. Yeah. The idea of the characters actively resisting a story is kind of farcical when you consider that even that resistance itself is the story Yes, that was forced upon them by somebody else. In my favorite episode of the show, episode four, when they're on the beach, they end up having this whole large discussion on whether they can accept Mariko or not. And it essentially ends with the family talking themselves into the fact that accepting Mariko is... The only way to keep them together. Yes, makes more sense to them than accepting their mistakes and breaking apart. Thus, they're willing to accept the complete ridiculousness that is the idea of a time-traveling granddaughter from the future. So, uh, I think that this comes across best in episode five, actually, Hmm. when the mother is, like, saying that, like, well, it's the fate of any mother who's ever had a son to have her, like, uh, have a strange woman call her uh, mother, uh, like indicating that like the son is going to get married and introduce new blood into the family, whether she likes it or not. And it doesn't make it really too much of a difference whether that's Maruko as the lover of Inumaru or if she was a genuine granddaughter to begin with. And like as she said, well, her children are going to be grandchildren 
to her regardless. Mm -hmm. One one final thing I want to say so that we can eventually move on is the idea that even though Inomara is really resistant to the story and he desperately wants to assume his own role as the main character, he doesn't really act towards it in the way he's supposed to. He only yeah. takes on the roles in name while never actually performing the expectations that come with the role. Like he can't be the patriarch of his own family because he never does anything that's worth being respected for. Yeah, it's one of those things where like he he's like savvy enough about the nature of stories to like understand how these sorts of stories do progress, but he doesn't realize that those stories progress because the characters are undertaking actions which bring them about. Yeah. And he's just like, well, if I set up the right situation, uh, Field of Dream style, the plot will come. <laughs> Sorry, it's the difference between somebody having to having a role assigned to them and then believing that everything that comes with that role will automatically come to them, or a character acting out everything that comes with a role, thus the role being assigned to them, even if they don't choose it themselves. Yeah. We could probably talk like twice as long about this show and what it's about and how it does it. But I want to sort of bring it back to this um, first thing about the self-referential nature of the story. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I mentioned prior to doing the episode summaries was that there's a short nature documentary piece at the beginning of each thing lasting a few minutes that introduces a bird. It's, It's always a bird and some facts about this bird. And it's very unsubtle in that it's quite apparent that they're talking about the plot, but in the way of by talking about these birds instead. Yeah. yeah. In the first episode, the bird they're centered on is a cuckoo. And they're talking about how the cuckoo uh, replaces uh, an egg in the nest with one of its own and has their child brought up by the other bird. And then the implication we're supposed to draw from this is that the cuckoo in this situation is Mariko, who is not a real member of the family unit but is inserting herself as like an ersatz member of the unit and being raised in the family unit alongside the natural born children, a.k.a. Inumaru. Although, in real life, cuckoos kill all other children. I mean, she she ends up killing Inumaru in the end, if you really think about it. He does die because of her. And and before he hatched. True. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, So... Yeah, episode five is about a uh, rhinoceros hornbill, which uh, the parents see, almost seal in the chick effectively into a hole in the um, in a in a tree, and then they come and feed it for while it's growing up, and then when it's like ready to fledge, they both sit on a branch outside and wait for it to uh, break the seal so it can get out and get to them. The whole the whole thing is about the like anxiety of uh, it's literally never experienced the outside world and doesn't know how to deal with it and the anxiety that comes with that. And that just perfectly fits into per- upon Inumaru's story who's trapped in the who's in episode one trapped in the family apartment and when he looks outside the door to see Mariko it's like a nice visual where everything's black around and he hears the voice of his mother to never open the door, to never go outside. He's trapped in this uh, idea of the family unit when he's thrust outside of it. He, abs- he has absolutely no idea on how to deal with it. And he's really like panicking. Though in episode five, then he does acquire skills of, of a certain kind of nature. He knows, he knows how to scam and steal now. And the mother actually proudly comments on the fact, stating that he's now able to provide for himself I think it's a very, it was a very interesting conceptual idea, especially since it's not actual birds, it's people in bird costumes. I don't yes. mention that, acting out little performances. Which makes a good segue to our uh, visual segment. Uh, like, well, it, it, uses, it does use birds, but it, it uses both. And that just adds to the sort of mixed up nature of the storytelling. There's quite a lot of innovations in this story. So as much as we've talked about Oshi, really we should probably credit the, this, the success of this show to two people, well, a lot of people, all the people who worked on it. We have our director, Mamoru Oshi, and we have almost more significantly in this case, uh, in terms of influence, uh, our animation director, Satoru Utsunomiya. Right. So this is, I guess, if like... I'm, I'm not sure, like, everyone probably has their own idea about what Oshii's magnum opus, but this would be, like, Utsunomiya's, definitely. Yeah. Um, he's worked on other stuff, but, like, in sometimes his, like, uh, feelings seem to be frustrated. Like, some of the articles we read were like, indicating that some things, like, Peak just never really... He, he got, like, an unsatisfactory version of his designs and was less inspired as a result. 
Whereas, whereas here, Oshi was pretty much con- uh, happy to let him do whatever he wanted. There's like a few choices that we need to talk about. One is that I think that if you don't really know very much about animation and you just saw this first episode and you'd like, I don't know, watched like uh, Haikyuu season one, that like just before. <laughs> if you'd watched Ghost in the Shell. Oh yeah. And you'd probably be like, wow, look how bad this is. Wasn't the 80s terrible? And then we'd have to like go, we'd have to like face Pam and go yara yara. <laughs> I'll be honest, that was actually my first thought when I just saw, like, the first, like, 20 minutes, like, the first 10 minutes or so, just, like, the character model looked kind of off. They were holding on certain shots for ages with very little movement until you actually realize what they're doing and why these decisions were made. And then you come around, like... So, like, we could start with the character designs. It yes. really, really likes this um, sort of puppet design, which he doesn't get to use very much. But, like, our characters like, are really puppet. We can see their joints. <laughs> less. They have sort of, like, awkward proportions. This actually makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, again, uh, anime is puppetry. It's puppets being puppeted by Oshi to act out his commentary on the Japanese nuclear family. <laughs> but while the character designs are very, like, simplified, they, this is done in the service of allowing a great, to convey a more realistic version of motion as opposed mm-hmm. to yeah. a realistic anatomy so to speak oh freya if if, if bunmei is actually the pup is actually the stand-in for oshi then the father gets literally puppeted by bunmei in episode five like you see him do hand <laughs> yes and the yes. father starts moving alongside that so that works even better that's a really good point one of the ways in which this anime was influential was like the the care that was taken in uh recreating realistic movement and motion mm-hmm. yeah I'll say a little bit about like some of the sort of the facial work um, because I don't really want to stress it too much. But the thing that like stood out to me was like how much I thought that Inumaru looked like a character from Akira, and this makes a lot of sense when you realize that just how many of the key animators on this worked on Akira, including Utsunomiya, including Ohira, who I'll mention briefly later. The animation in this is very much in the aggressively limited animation style that people wouldn't generally associate with Mitsu or Isu. I'll talk about him in a second as well. <laughs> <laughs> but like the influence in this seems to have came from Utsunomiya and this work in particular. The idea is that to focus less on the in-betweening, the drawings in between the extreme poses, keyframes, and to like try and make it so that like every frame is a keyframe, so to speak. This gives you this gives you more places where you have control of the movement because you can change it like any joint when you've got just got in between you're just there's no real control it's just about going between one image and the next i i'm explaining it very badly the people who really care about sakuga are are like looking at this and going well listening to this and going stop talking Ian. you don't know what you're talking about but that's because you're a sakuga baby Ian. you're still growing (laughs) a baby yeah (laughs) like one of the things i that really put me off on their character designs was their lip volumes it, it looks very distinct in just the fact that there is actual volume to the lip. Like, there's the line. Uh, there's, like, if you simply draw a circle for the line, there's a smaller circle inside for the bottom row of the lip, for, like, the back row of the lip. And that just felt really off to me on an anime character. Uh, again, I think it's somewhat in service of the, like, realism thing, because they do move their mouths very <laughs> more expressly than anime characters had uh, much of the time up to that point. Mm-hmm. And that's probably why it still feels kind of off because it's the first time they're really trying to experiment with that concept and idea that they didn't really know how to properly do it. Maybe. So, um, in terms of like re- really good action scenes, I don't think there is too much to worry about there. Like, Denny and Freya both know how much of a problem I have with modern action shows because of their <sighs> <high> choreography. <laughs> What you don't like a million cubes uh, coming up? I forgot which animator is credited with that. Uh, with that becoming so common, y- Utapon cubes. Yeah. Yes, Utapon cubes. Thank you. I like. I, I mean, I like the cubes well enough, but it's it's a lot of the other stuff. I that comes don't. Over. It, it's the fight choreography that I don't yeah. like. Like it's all animated very well. It's but it's the choreography that like really pulls it down. And this is true of Hollywood movies as well. I really hate action movie choreography. But what we have here is all the fights are really just Inamaru saying, "Look over there," and then hitting someone with a pipe. Or no, no, he says, "Look over there, a UFO." A UFO, yes. 
So the action was very Ian friendly in that sense. <laughs> it's less action and more of just a gag that they repeat five times. Because right. he does it once in every episode, I think. So when it comes down to the animation, like the, you, we're not getting the flashy fight scenes. It's all the character animation in this show. And especially because a lot of the sequences were, a lot of the animators were given quite long sequences to work with. There's, uh, in episode four, there's an ESO sequence, which is one of my favorite ones, which is when he is arguing with uh, Boonmei as the Yakuza shop bone boss about, about the work he has to do, done in proper ESO full limited style. I mean, it's just hilarious for a start, but it's just so expressive. You can just watch it for, and it's two minutes of just, they, they just gave to this one animator. Uh, oh. to... right. Inamara's hopping the way the string, like, um, the, the rope uh, that he's tied with, like, uh, flexes. Yeah, and this did not seem to be unusual. It's not like, here's 10 seconds to animate, go away and do that. It's, here's two minutes, go yes. away and animate that. And uh, Oshi seems to have kept this idea because Iso famously animated the tank scene in uh, Ghost in the Shell, which is also really good. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's a great scene. I, th- I think maybe the biggest moment of actual action comes in um, episode five when he's shoplifting and there's a big chase sequence where Inumaru is running a lot. It's definitely the most like large movements in that scene. It's very fluid and looks really nice. Yes, well, they somewhat break the uh, stage theming, but mm. then they, they also don't because when they're in the uh, shop, there's the awesome, uh, there's the really silly bit where they like swap things where she steals the dress and then they steal the food and put it under her dress. And then... Yeah, I, I would say that the, the way they break the staging most common is they have the one indoor scene and the one outdoor scene, and the outdoor scene is what breaks it, mm-hmm. uh, whether that's the beach or the driving scene or whatever. But they do have like awesome like um, transitions between that, like in episode two, where <laughs> the uh, the inside is completely dark except for the characters you can see through the window, and Bunmei just slowly slides across into the into the frame. That was that was a great. <laughs> that was one. hilarious. Uh, the other thing that I would focus that I would say is worth noting about it animation wise is the focus on accurate shadows. Yes, yes, that was another thing in the episode four scene that I really liked. Like, I think that the, it stood out to me actually most of the first episode when he's just standing in front of the door and all we see is the door with a black background and he's yeah. just uh, doing the like, who is on the other side of the door? Uh, what if I open it? What will happen? <laughs> and then you can just sort of like pay attention just to like how accurate the shadow is. It's It was very rare at the time. It's still quite rare to put that much effort into into shadow work. Although like this is one of the uh, advantages of CG is that you set up your light sources and the shadows come for free. I also want to like uh, credit Oshi's storyboarding. Like, I I love that like sequence in the first episode of like you have the camera is basically at one a fixed position. It tracks them across, and then Inumaru walks up to the camera, and it's like actually been the uh, the keyhole of the um, mm. the door the whole time. That was great. That was really good. Yeah, like it, it was just entirely good. <laughs> 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 also also the use of spotlights and like the, the the like theater thing of lighting the whole thing in like one color mm. um was used really well i don't know if that's a i've got to stop referencing brecht i don't know <laughs> if that's a brechtian thing but considering that ikahar was also influenced by brecht and it shows up in his uh shows all the time i have to assume it might be i mean it's, it's a theater thing Mm. Yeah, and these they specifically they were using the color goldenrod, which is the um, which is a kind of yellow. It's the kind of yellow that was on her dress, and like they keep going back to that over and over again when they do this. That it's just goldenrod and black. And it's the color of the uh, wheat outside. I think we've mostly talked about everything that we would sort of mention. There's uh, one more thing that I want to mention at least is the focus pull in episode four, which is not something I can consciously remember seeing in other anime. It must have happened. But it's 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 Maruko facing the camera and Inumaru's in the background. And the camera does like a proper just focus pull from him to her. And it just really took me out of the episode because I don't remember it. I don't really remember those moments that well uh, in other shows. And I just really like that moment. It's definitely happened, though I cannot think of any examples of this. But yeah, 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 exactly. It's not a very common thing. And generally, anime does a lot of cutting because it's just still images. So everything can easily be in focus. Is that is it? Am I correct in saying that most anime don't put things out of focus unless it's like a doing like a first person shot and the character is like blinking and it's blurry to him? 
we're seeing a lot more in recent times of yeah. them, uh, taking care with field of view, but uh, it certainly was a lot rarer, or at least you would, because you would have needed to do it with an action with actual camera tricks at this time, mm-hmm. like set up your apparatus, get the camera to actually work that way, um, or draw it, and drawing it is a pain. <laughs> so they would use the camera if they could. Nowadays, it's a bit easier because we've got uh, filters and stuff that can do this for us. And so yeah, it's just yeah. one sh- final shout out to an animator has to go to Shinya Ohira for in episode two. Um, they have like an extended dialogue with Bunmei w- where he's like just confronting them. And then we get some really good base show stuff on uh, Inumaru. Like yeah. it's it's like a tight close up. It's his face, like all the wrinkles are just great. This is like this is what was actually the part that made me think. I wonder if these people worked in Akira because I was. <laughs> but like this isn't your this isn't your regular lip flaps here. <laughs> the face is just amazing. It's kind of interesting mentioning Akira. I think it was, uh, one of the articles we read was all talking about how Akira, obviously, way more famous uh, in the West and mm. probably Japan. And yet it had way less influence on um, uh, animated movements afterwards than uh, this did. Well, yeah, because Akira, uh, I think, went in more of like the Disney mold of yeah. trying to be as like smooth as possible. And obviously, while anime does do this from time to time, we generally don't do it in TV series because it's expensive. So we've developed an entirely new repertoire of tricks and this stuff, like the Utsinomiya style, is much more adaptable to that. God, we could, I, 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 like, again, I feel like I could talk forever about this, but we, we're, we're, we need to press on. So, yeah, we, we need to start talking about the music and the sound in this. It's uh, <laughs> Mamoru Oshii, so of course, the composer is Kenji Kawai, uh, who we already talked about in uh, Windy. Windy Tales, who I think has scored pretty much all of his works after this, and probably most of them before this too. Here is less of the, like, pared down minimalistic atmospheric stuff that you would get in uh, Ghost in the Shell, although there is a bit of that, and more of the, like, repeated uh, strings motifs and uh, synth uh, stuff that's more common in his uh, other works. Uh, I really liked the music and the like golf uh, golf club versus baseball bat um, scene in the first episode. Yeah, it's this weird repeated like steel pan, and um, I don't know what the other like uh, and like well, just a repetitive drum beat uh, motif. It's weirdly intense. Uh, I was not expecting it. Anyway, music is mostly used fine. It's not the standout here. In terms of sound direction, I think like we've been noticing this in a lot of OVAs, but like where I, I keep joking that they keep including music videos. In this <laughs> case, we have multiple songs by uh, the main characters. You know, Maru has his own song, like on his guitar. He has more than one song, actually. Bunmei has a piano number in episode four. Literal credits come up on screen every time a song number starts, so it's definitely deliberate. Uh, the uh, Tamiko, the mother, and the PI have a duet in episode five. Mm. The only one who doesn't get a number is the father, Anne Mariko. Not like we needed his opinion anyway. Well, what would he sing about? <laughs> I'm sad. My family's fallen apart. I deserve the respect that you're not giving me. I'm Squat Hank Hill. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this this was a bold move. <laughs> Some might say that they were filling up space. Yeah, but then the the scene in episode four lets it's gonna be a go ham with the like uh, with the like playing animation. So, like, it's yeah. definitely the, mo- the the bits of the episodes that have the most heavy editing. Is, and I do think episode four with that music number was their bit because it's the one that gets like the most attention out of any individual scene. Yeah, there's more editing and cuts in that music video than there is basically in the rest of the entire show. Uh, like as for opening and ending music, uh, I don't really have anything to say about the ending. Well, the ending, the endings are different in each episode. I think it's just mm-hmm. a like random piece of soundtrack music. It, it's it's nice, but it's also not much to say about it. But the opening for the first five episodes is Gosenzo Sama Bambanzai by uh, Yumi Kojima. She does a bunch of the songs in this. 
she's had a sort of a handful of scarred appearances in anime, but I couldn't really like put my finger on a pattern that I could tell that I could like point to and say, aha, this is her. What we've got is just some nice chill city pop, which makes sense because it's the uh, late 80s. This is like peak city pop time. But they made a they they had a bold choice of visuals for this opening. Mm. It just got sort of static with like periodic like wavelets appearing on the screen <clears> and uh, like very limited amount of kinetic text. It was just kind of chill. Like the I thought that the use of city pop was very good, but I don't really know how to interpret the use of static because normally I would say that like they're making very a very apparent that it's a TV show, but like that clashes with the idea of it being a stage play well i like the idea that it is static because the tv show isn't here it's gone it's broken okay that's a really stupid uh argument but it's the one i'm going with i mean i i, I just have the factoid for you that the static was hand drawn which feels like such an extra step to go to like i don't know how easy it would have been for well, like well i, I actually I, could, I i know roughly how easy it would have been to generate that static but <laughs> I don't, but I don't think they had the process set up for it. I think it was just e- uh, just as easy for them to do it hand drawn as it would have been for them to figure out how to do it via computer. Hmm. But it's nice because, um, like, we don't get any sort of artistic clash between it. Also, city pop is very much a blending of Western influence with uh, Japanese tradition. So there's that. But rather than the music, the thing that like kept getting me was the use of sound effects in this show. Like my favorite one is just that every time like Inumaru like he gets hit, it's just a dog yelping. Yeah. Which is obviously the play on his name, Inu meaning dog. But it also like really makes you feel it because like it's the sound of like a dog being hit, right? Yes. Like you feel that one in your soul in a way that like hearing a teenager going like ow would not. <laughs> yeah. My favorite sound effect is in the first episode when their dad like rips the newspaper apart. It makes a glass shattering sa- uh, sound. Up to that point in the episode, it's been fairly chill, and then they immediately go into their big uh, uh, like square off after that. That was really good use of like uh, tension building, and then the uh, release. But they're, they're they're doing that thing where they're choosing, in particular, animal sounds. Yes, but it's. It's not the sounds you generally expect. A lot of times people are going for a certain realism with their um, music, with their sound design. There they went full cartoon yeah. in the like, let's pick something that sort of is out there, but feels right. And like, it was like, it was like, it was a little jarring, but gen- but I never really felt that it was out of the, out there. I mean, my, f- my favorite one was in episode two where, we see them, they sit in their new house and they sit next to a bunch of windows that show a field in the background with a Coke sign. And there's just this digger, uh, this machine driving around the background. So we already have the kind of machine noise. And then we have a close-up shot of the father and Bunmei comes slowly from the left into the scene and we have the machine driving sounds and it just works so well. I also really like the, the audience getting uh, like clapping at certain points. Particularly, they like accentuate Bunmei's big speech in episode five about uh, uh, stories and their endings. Why do we think, though, that episode five was the one where they chose to show the audience rather than simply hint at it? It's the climax. I mean, yeah, that's kind of the obvious. Uh, it's, it's all about Bunmei being, I'm bringing this fucking thing to an end. <laughs> God, I'm ending this before it ends me. And then he ends himself. I'm not sure that they brought the audience in at the right point, but it was the right episode. Mm. Yes. There's also, and I'm going to use this to transition onto the voice acting, uh, there's also a thing they do where when the characters are having their monologues, internal or not, they'll apply like an an echo effect to like, I, I guess they're trying to reproduce the whole like standing on a stage and orating loudly, uh, which is pretty cool. Again, just adding to the whole aesthetic. Oh, speaking of monologues, that also reminds me that uh, something I wanted to point out is the fact that when they're having their monologues, all the other characters freeze in the background. Yes. Although um, it, when he's having his one in the first episode, his mother keeps interjecting, which is really funny. Yes. <laughs> Her voice actress did a really good job. Uh, magical. Mashio. Just embodying all the eccentricities of the character and like her timing was great. And the like moment where she like, does the really high-pitched, high-speed um, ranting in the first episode. 
uh, like weirdly weirdly enough, she hasn't done like a huge amount. Her major work would be in Urusei Yatsura as the character of Sakura. So she's Sakura in like, all of uh, your Urusei Yatsura. But other than that, her like major credit would be in uh, Laputa Castle in the Sky. I wonder if she's more of a theater actor. I don't know. Uh, to be honest, like anime, as say you performances in general always sound very theatrical to me, or at least, I mean, th- that's kind of true for voice acting as well, at least to me. <laughs> English voice acting, sorry. I think most of the people in here have been in Urusei Yatsura in some way or form. What a surprise. So, uh, for example, uh, Toshio Furukawa, who played uh, our hero, our hero? Uh, who played Inumaru anyway, was uh, Ataru in Urusei Yatsura. Which uh, like contrasts from like one of his more famous roles, which would be Piccolo in Dragon Ball. <laughs> well, I was actually a little surprised that he is still alive in the same way that, uh, <laughs> surprised that uh, Goku's ac- uh, voice actor is still alive. But like, it's nice to think that this person who has been like voice acting for longer than any of us have been alive is still like <laughs> being Piccolo. The person who uh, I really want to talk would have liked to talk about um, would have been Masako Katsuki, though. So uh, she played Maruko. She often plays the sort of the more like contemptuous, mature woman, like the sort of person that go like that refers to you as Yatsu. Shout out to the Japanese listeners. <laughs> but like she's done with the proper lady before, uh, and that kind of fits the role she's done here. Although that might be anachronistic because I'm forgetting when she did what. But yes, also Nurse Yatsura, and also still going in 2020, uh, which is very impressive. But mostly, she's her most famous role would be Sailor Neptune. I think I think that's all we have to say about about sound. I mean, I hope the the listeners appreciate that we've talked for about an hour and a half, and we've barely touched the content of the actual episodes, like plot wise. I also hope they're appreciating this. Mm. Well, that's that's because the plot is relatively simple. Weirdly, <laughs> yes. like we all watched the same video from uh, what was the channel called? Jump the Shark. Uh, who did their video on Go Senso Sama uh, Bambansai for uh, Pause and Select Novid November thing. And yeah. he did say that he was going to do an additional one. So I'm looking forward to that whenever it comes out. Mm-hmm. Link in the description. I guess the only thing I really have left to say is I should talk a little bit about the movie. Because as Denny mentioned at the beginning, they cut this into a 90-minute movie called Maruko, which was released the same year. Obviously, there was some stuff that was obviously going to get cut. No animal documentary. Most of the songs get cut, no openings, endings. But at least for episodes one and two, they basically got most of those episodes in. So up until the part where uh, Inamaru escapes with um, Maruko. The thing that I really like about the movie is that it's told as a frame story. So the episode six, which is the sort of epilogue episode, uh, a lot of it is framed as uh, Inamaru talking to a soba vendor. This is the frame story for the movie, and it gradually cuts back to that. And I think it syncs up really well. I actually think it like it makes episode six look bad in how well it, it does it. Uh, episodes four, f- f- uh, three, four, and five get a lot more cut from them, mm-hmm. including my favorite ISO scene from episode four. Episode three, which I thought was the weakest episode, works really well in this context because they cut out all the stuff with the mother and the PI that's about half the episode. Good choice. For instance, instead of dealing with the shoplifting stuff, they just cut out that and skip straight to the cafe they flee to. The editing choices are mostly pretty good. In fact, I think it like really enhances the stage play presentation because you don't see a lot of the secondary stages that we've talked about. They like the bits that aren't moving. You mostly get the places that are static. Hmm. So you could imagine that in between the like the scene darkens we go we, the spotlight comes on the narrator the narrator talks a little bit the light comes up and we're at the new place so i think it works really well in terms of the stage play um idea the one major thing that i might complain about is that at the end of episode five where we have the sort of revelation about bunme and mariko like their relationship as mutual parent and child that doesn't get mentioned at all meaning that gets left a bit ambiguous but if you're a fan of the idea that we don't know that they were actually time travels and may have just been scam artists the entire way along, this really plays into that. And the only other thing that I have to say is that it might have been a consequence of the media of the versions that we got, but the colors seemed a little bit more vibrant in the movie. Like the goldenrod actually seemed like a goldenrod as opposed to a sort of a more paler yellow. 
One thing is, what do we think about the decision they made with episode five and episode six? The fact that they chose to end it on the narrative climax in episode six, on episode five, and then have an entire 30 minutes episode six. I like it. Just to me, it's kind of like Bunray's had his whole uh, spiel about beginning, middle, and end. And then instead of having an end, you have an epilogue. Because Bunray's just had his whole spiel about beginning, middle, end, and then you have the uh, the the actual final episode of it is an epilogue where one character is just like, "Man, that whole thing was a mess," which which feels very uh, in tune with <laughs> both the point of Bunray's speech and like the whole show, and then mm. the fact that it actually ends with Inumaru's like dying is also a good choice. Like I, one of my favorite lines from the entire show was, I think. Bunmei saying that there are only two moments that a character can never uh, visit themselves, yes. which is the moment of their birth and the moment of their death. And in episode six, we, we as the audience get to visit one of them, which is Inumaru's. I assume he dies. I think that's the best reading for that scene. But he himself does not get to visit that. His story just ends there in the snow. I did like the melodramatic ending. I was overall kind of a fan of this sort of epilogue wrap up because, especially because I really liked the way that he, the, like the conversation with the silver vendor went. Yes, right? mm-hmm. I liked the fact that he called into question whether any of it was true to begin with, or whether this was all just a new trying to scam another silver. I also love the like it's keeping the audience dynamic because the silver vendor sounds like he's behind the camera. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really good choice, and I really um, like. I say the fact that it becomes a frame story in the movie works really really well. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a great uh, idea. Uh, my, I, I, I have my minor quibble with episode five, which is that because we get like a lot of the stage reveal of the audience during uh, like a Bunmei monologue, and he still has to try and go through the rigmarole of arresting them, of attempting to arrest the main characters. I think misplaced. I think. What I really would have liked is for like the cat, the cast to take a bow. Oh yeah, like after the after the um, after Boon Kins himself, they all get up and take a bow. I think that would have I think that would have put it over the top for me. But overall, like I I, I thought it was a good idea. Uh, the the other point I just want to ask, just a personal question, is which was your favorite episode? I've already said I think mine was episode four because I really like the press conference that happens when the mother arrives and she like tries to present her facts like oh you know, here's here's what happens here's what the investigation has revealed then like a podium comes up with microphones and Amara takes the stage and he makes his arg- his emotional arguments against the facts how about you Freya? honestly on a pure emotional level the first one just because of um uh I, I wasn't expecting anything about the show it, it really pleased me and then the rest was also just a good continuation of that Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a full episode, the first one, as a sub-episode, like, I've already told you my favorite scene, but after that, it's the Silver Vendor. I also do really like uh, Bunmei's scene in episode five. Uh, although, structurally, it could probably be a bit better, him uh, throwing the background up and then walking under it is great. Like, I actually feel that, like, maybe we should have just waited and said that as we were giving our ratings for this show. <laughs> uh, but, oh, like, well. maybe, maybe, Den- maybe, Denny, you can start us off with... Uh, how many uh, cans of brand name cola style beverage do you get <laughs> out of? Well, I initially, at least while I was episode watching episode one for the first time, I wasn't really that fond of this show. I feel like I didn't really get it, as I already said. But now that I've seen it more than once and I've had a lot of time to think about it, man, is this a great show on so many aspects. It's definitely made me think more about anime than any other show I've seen in like the last 10 years or so about the nature of stories, the nature of animation, the nature of roles. Like, as I said, I've written more notes for this than I have for possibly uh, our last 29 episodes combined. I really like this show. Although at the same time, I don't think it's a perfect show. I have some minor quibbles with, um, with the fact that I do agree with Ian, they could have taken the theater gimmick even further with an audience bow, with removing basically every extraneous scene besides the musical numbers, because I'd like to imagine the musical numbers being like projected onto a screen on stage. And I, I feel like the idea they had in the movie with the episode six being like a frame story works so well that I kind of uh, docking the series for it. So I think I'm going to give this a 4.5. How about you, Ian? 
one of the things that we haven't really talked about is just how funny this show is. Like this was the thing I I kept trying I kept trying to figure out how to shoehorn in and it never happened. Mm-hmm. There there is some just really good comedic timing just when the action is happening and just something is happening slowly in the background. Um, they really are willing to let you anticipate uh, and like have those jokes that get funnier because you see it coming. In episode two, for instance, when Kinokuni is going to attack Bunmei and he's just going slower. And like you can tell that the cell is just being moved ever so slightly every frame closer and closer to him. And then they cut away and then he's just been hit. Uh, not uh, Kinokuni, so just everything went wrong for him. Like the joke was all anticipation <laughs> and then like almost no payoff, but it worked really, really well. It sounds bad when I phrase it that way, but they were just really good at doing that. The dialogue was was very good. I was very happy with it. And like I said, um, when you go for a, a self-referential fourth wall breaking show, there's the tendency to be lol references, lol deep. This is not that. This is really well executed. I'm very happy with it. Four and a half. <laughs> so I feel like I would have liked this show a lot less if they had not had the whole intro scene with them fighting. I think it would have made the theme very different uh, and worse uh, because then it would just be, oh no, Western influence destroying the (laughs) happy family life. But just with the like little things they did and making it about how uh, that tradition may not have ever been worth that much and we're destined to die anyway, just on top of the really really great visual execution the the voice acting was really happy with this my quibble is i don't really know what the pi is there for um and whenever he's on screen screen he's just kind of distracting maybe somebody can give me an argument to why he's there and i'll accept it uh but i tried to think about it a lot and i couldn't come up with anything because maybe that's just more on me than anything else i mean i i think just one of the reasons I think he's there is to show that the, even though the mother is trying to resurrect the idea of the family unit and reclaim her position, she's clearly happier with the stranger than she is with the father. Because Maybe, they, yeah. they act, they do act together. Like they have a duet. It's not the father and the mother who have a duet together. It's the mother and the PI showing that there's definitely more of a connection between them. Point undocked. Um, <laughs> It sounds like the movie is actually a better version of this, but I can't say that because I haven't seen it. I actually do recommend the movie entirely. If you don't want to watch it for three hours, watch it for an hour and a half. You're, you'll get pretty much the exact same experience. And I was going to say everybody should watch at least the first episode, but no, just watch the movie, I guess. Um, and then if you like that, watch the show uh, later sometime. Uh, five soda cans. Making this now the second highest rated show. Yeah, like, yes. it, like it, if it, it didn't get straight fives, so it can't be the top. <laughs> Man, Yokohama really knocked out the park. <laughs> it did. This may be, no, it's not my new favorite Hoshi thing. Um, well, I guess I just really like him. Because he's already made two of my favorite anime films. Yeah, we we should probably do a, a special episode about him sometime because he's an interesting figure. Mm-hmm. Def- we'll definitely do that. Okay, verdicts have been rendered. Denny, have you got any additional facts for us? Yes, I have two uh, facts. One, which isn't really any sort of hidden trivia or anything, but I just think it's kind of funny that we chose to review uh, Bum Banzai like, only a few weeks before the first anime that Oshi's worked on in 12 years or so comes out, because he hasn't yes. done anything in anime since Skycrawlers in 2008. The actual piece of trivia I have for you is that uh, Gazenza Sama Ban Banzai is Kunihiko Ikehara's favorite anime. Oh, is it his favorite anime or his favorite Oshi anime? I thought it was, uh, was it just his favorite Oshi anime? I thought it was his favorite anime in general. Either way, not very surprising. Uh, <laughs> it has a lot of the hallmarks that his uh, shows do, obviously done very differently. The whole, like, uh, pontificating on the nature of stories, the 4-4 breaks, the theatrical elements, yeah, it's all very ikuni. Significantly less gay, though, which means that it's worse. I mean, what? <laughs> Next week, we won't have a regular episode because we'll be reviewing all of Mamoru Oshii's live-action films at once. 
or or more seriously because we're going to do a christmas special episode because we like to we we deserve a christmas break too i guess Uh, and after that we'll come back with a real buster in the new year uh, I wonder what Denny could be referencing. <laughs> it, it was so subtle. I know. I couldn't think of a good Gynax pun. We're the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Banzai. Bon bonsai. Bon bonsai. This doesn't mean anything without the other half of the sentence. Oh well. <laughs> no, I know it's it's still just bonsai, like a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. This is all. This is all. This is all going over the uh, thing fading out, which means that we're getting quite quiet.